It is therefore time for question period. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thanks, Speaker. And good morning. My question is to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, this morning Global News reported that utilities in Ontario charged customers $12.4 million just to send out disconnection notices last year. Some customers were billed as much as $55 for a single notice of pending disconnection. A stamp is $0.85, cents, Speaker, and email is even less than that. Hydro One even admitted that the cost of sending a disconnection notice is only $1.05. Speaker, why does the Premier think it's fair that thousands of Ontarians who already can't pay their hydro bill are also being charged for the privilege of being told that they're going to be disconnected. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Energy is going to want to speak to the specifics of, uh, of this notification, but Mr. Speaker, let me just say that what we know is fair is that across this province, people have seen a reduction of, on average, 25 per cent in their electricity yeah, yeah. bills, Mr. Speaker, and people living in uh, more remote and uh, rural communities up to a 40 to 50 per cent uh, reduction, Mr. Speaker. We knew and we know that people were struggling. Order. With their electricity prices, Mr. Speaker, so that's what our Fair Hydro Plan addresses, Mr. Speaker. It actually addresses the challenges that people were facing because, Mr. Speaker, we had made investments in our electricity system to make it reliable, Mr. Speaker. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, come to order, and you've signaled that I may need to go to warnings right away. I will oblige if I have to. Finish, please. The system was not clean. It was not reliable. It is now, Answer. Mr. Speaker. There was a cost associated with that, but people have seen reductions in their bills, Mr. Speaker. That's what's fair. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, for years, for three years, the Premier said that there was no crisis in electricity in Ontario. She didn't act until it became an election crisis for her and the Liberal government of Ontario. And we know that the Fair Hydro Plan, which is really unfair, doesn't do anything to fix the problem in Ontario's electricity crisis. It just makes it worse. Speaker, the Ontario Energy Board doesn't require companies to track disconnection notices, but most do. And we know that across Ontario, roughly one and a half million and disconnection notices were sent out last year. One and a half million. Electricity that's so expensive that hundreds of thousands of Ontarians can't afford it and can't afford the disconnection notice they get for the power that they can't afford. Follow the logic here. Speaker, why is it that the government is Question. allowing outrageous profits to be made from customers who can't afford their hydro bills in the first place? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So if we're following the logic, let's look at the very first thing that we did, which is a 25 percent reduction for every family in this household, which they voted against, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Going on with that, Mr. Speaker, following the logic, all they would have to do is look to what the OEB is doing, Mr. Speaker. The OEB is currently undertaking a comprehensive review of its customer service rules, and we look forward to seeing that result later this year, Mr. Speaker. On top of that, if we're following logic, Mr. Speaker, which is something that they don't have on that side of the House, Mr. Speaker, on November 15th, they are well aware, Mr. Speaker, that the OEB banned winter disconnections from November 15th until April 30th of 2018. The OEB is mandated that all customers who are currently disconnected be reconnected as soon as possible at no charge, Mr. Speaker. The OEB Answer. and their decision also re requires the removal of load-limiting devices and anything else, Mr. Speaker, that Thank is you. affecting customers, that is something, Mr. Speaker, that we're supporting on this. Thank side. you. Final supplementary. Speaker, this is the Liberal legacy in Ontario. People are getting cut off of their electricity at record rates. Listen to this. Last year, approximately 60,000 Ontarians had their power cut off. 60,000. We know now that across Ontario, roughly one and a half million Ontarians have been served with disconnection notices. That's one in every three homes is being hit with a disconnection notice. Welcome to Liberal Ontario. These are the numbers. You can't dispute them. And still, utilities are charging up to $55 for disconnection notices that only cost $1.05 to actually produce. How the heck do you explain that, Mr. Speaker? Speaker, why do the most catastrophic mistakes of this government always Question. seem to fall on the people of Ontario who can least afford them? Thank you. 
Stop talking. You see it, please? You see it, please? Minister. Mr. Speaker, so welcome to Liberal Ontario, where your rates have gone down 25 per cent, Mr. Hey. Speaker. Welcome to Liberal Ontario, where you're seeing more infrastructure built right across this oh, province than ever before, Mr. Speaker. Welcome to Liberal Ontario, where you don't have coal as part of your electricity system. Welcome to Liberal Ontario, where we're raising minimum wage and looking after our workers, Mr. Speaker. The list goes on. We are very proud of our record in making sure that we've invested in health care, that we've invested in infrastructure, that we've invested in, in education and in advanced education, Mr. Speaker, in training, in research. You know, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to welcoming people to Liberal Ontario, we do that with open arms. We're encouraging businesses. We're encouraging people. We're seeing more and more people come to Ontario. Our unemployment rate is at its lowest ever, thanks to the uh, Minister of Economic Development and yes, Growth. Sir. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to take that member on any time to debate a Liberal Ontario on the best. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. We're in warnings. New question. The member from Huron Bruce. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last week, many Ontarians were shocked to learn of a new secret home care agency that her government will be creating. What we want to know is who she consulted with in creating this agency. Was anyone other than the organization running hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of attack ads on behalf of the Liberals? even consulted. This is a question of ethics, Speaker, not merits. We want to know about the relationship that the Premier and her Liberal government had with its former party president. Speaker, I have a straightforward yes or no question. Will the Premier do the right thing and release all of the correspondence that her office had with the SEIU and all other question. relevant stakeholders ahead of the home care changes announced in October? Wow. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to speak on, uh, on the specifics, but, but Mr. Speaker, you know, our priority with a very complex issue in terms of making sure that uh, the people who we love, the people who have raised us, the people who have built this province, that they have the care that they need and that they want, Mr. Speaker. And that means that there needs to be a range of care. And, you know, I hear the heckling from the other side. We've had a lot of time. We have been investing in home care, Mr. Speaker. We have been working to make that, that transformation in the health care system that actually gives people who are needing care in their homes or in the community, those options, Mr. Speaker. We continue to look for uh, ideas. We continue to look for models, Mr. Speaker, that will provide better care for people who either yes, want sir. to stay in their home, want to stay in the community, or, Mr. Speaker, need long-term care. That's our priority, is making sure that those people have Thank the you. care that they need. Supplementary member from Elgin, Middlesex, Thank you very much, Speaker. Back to the Premier. In her 2015 report of community care access centres, the Auditor General found serious issues. The government was spending 39 per cent of their total budget on administration costs alone. Wow. Wow. They created a needlessly complex system that resulted in gaps in care and left patients suffering. And now we're hearing the government has quietly put forward a plan for a new home care bureaucracy with zero consultation with industry stakeholders. Instead of spending precious dollars on home care and patients, this government has instead opted to expand the bureaucracy to the benefit of their liberal insider friends. Wow. Given the government's poor home care track record, this will clearly not benefit patients. Can the, minister, can the Premier explain why this announcement was buried at the bottom of a press release and rushed through no consultation? And will the minister commit to disclosing any involvement SEIU has had in this decision? Here, here. Health and long -term care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, if the member opposite had have been paying attention, he would have known in early October yeah. that at Kensington, that is a tremendous provider of home care services. They have a hospice as yeah. well. They have a residential setting for uh, individuals that require support. He would have known that in early October, I spoke in front of 
many media representatives, well, many secret. cameras, uh, at the I'm same time that we announced government. an increase in our funding to home care across this province. But I specifically and emphatically described this, this model, which is in fact Just a reminder for those that maybe didn't hear me, I said we're in warnings. <coughs> model that has been used successfully in California, in Massachusetts, in Michigan, Answer. in Oregon, and many other places around the world, the model that we're following to give choice to those who require home care. Thank you. Speaker. Yep. Supplementary. A final supplementary. The member from Leeds, Turnbull. Uh, thanks, Speaker. Back to the Premier. For years, this Liberal government has looked out for the interest of insiders and the well-connected first, leaving everyday Ontarians paying more working harder and getting less. Yep. This deal to create the SEIU-backed home care model certainly looks like history repeating itself. Yep. SEIU has been described by some as having cozy ties to this government, and as yep. my colleagues have said, their GR head is a former head, former president of the Liberal Party. Yep. That's what they do. This deal wow. the other members have outlined doesn't pass the smell test. Speaker, my question to the Premier is simple. Just how much influence has Michael Spitale have on the creation of this SEIU-backed organization. Smell. So, Mr. Speaker, we're piloting. The member from the PM Carleton will withdraw. The member from Carleton is warned. Carry on. Here we're piloting two new innovative self-directed care models. One model is we're going to provide funds directly to home care clients to purchase the services themselves. But we need to acknowledge there's a, a subset outside of that, roughly 6,000 people maximum across the province, that don't want to remit taxes for their employee to Revenue Canada, that don't want to negotiate or find it challenging to negotiate those contracts with employees. So we're going to provide that subset with complex needs, more than 14 hours of home care needs a week with the opportunity to select and schedule their own personal support worker. We're going to do that yes, and we're going to support them as many jurisdictions in the United States and around the world have done successfully. You, new question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Schools in Ontario need $15.9 billion worth of repairs just to get them to decent standards for our children. That's a very big number, Speaker, with very big consequences. In the summer, that number means kids that are in the classroom sweating in their seats uh, because schools can't afford air conditioning on hot days. In the winter, which is upon us, it means a second grader, for example, trying to focus on her math test while fumbling with her winter gloves and parking because the heat is broken yet again at the school. We have to do better for our children in this province. Why did the Premier allow this $15.9 billion school repair backlog to get so bad? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let's just look at the facts of what has happened over the last number of years, Mr. Speaker. First of all, we inherited a system that was seriously degraded, Mr. Speaker. One of the reasons, as I've said in this House and elsewhere, one of the reasons that I am in provincial politics is because of the policies of the previous government that allowed our publicly funded education system to degrade in the classroom, outside of the classroom, Mr. Speaker. And so uh, that's why I'm here. That's why many of us are here. So we have invested 17.5 $5 billion in capital funding. We've built 820 new schools, Mr. Speaker, and we've uh, invested in more than 800 retrofits and additions, Mr. Speaker. And when you think of the, the reality that there are uh, in the order of 5,000 publicly funded schools in this province, Mr. Speaker, that is a huge percentage of schools that have either been rebuilt or have been renovated. Since 2013, we've invested $9.3 billion in capital funding to support more than 120 new schools and more than 140 additions and renovations. So that rebuild and that renovation continues, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. 
Well, Speaker, the fact remains there's a $15.9 billion backlog in repairs for schools in this province. The dis disrepair in Ontario schools started with the Conservative government. I don't disagree with that observation that was just made by the Premier because that government cut school maintenance budgets and left a $5.6 billion backlog when they were at the helm. It? It's continued, however, with the Liberal government that has often provided just one-tenth of what schools actually need to keep up with repairs. Why did the Premier break her promise to Ontarians and follow in the Conservatives' footsteps when it comes to education funding that leaves too many children in this province trying to learn in buildings that are falling apart around their ears? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. And I, I, first of all, Mr. Speaker, there is no government in the history of this province that has inv invested more in education than this government on this side of the House. And, Mr. Speaker, you know I know that there are advocates here who are concerned about the, the state of our schools, and we know that good school environments provide better learning environments for students. I want to thank Fix Our Schools and for all of their advocacy and the advice that they've given to us, Mr. Speaker. And you know what, Mr. Speaker, we are following through. After inheriting a system, as the Premier has pointed out, in complete disrepair, we have been making those investments in new schools, in additions, as well as in the repair of schools. This year alone, our government will spend $1.4 billion on school renewal, Mr. Speaker, which is in line with what the Auditor General has advised on an ongoing basis to keep our schools in a good state of repair. Mr. Speaker, we know there is more work to be done, and that's exactly what what we're doing. We're making those investments Thank and we're you. working with school boards to do so. Thank you. Final supplementary. Premier's record on, on education is abysmal. Since 2011, since 2011, the Liberals have closed more than 270 schools and put another 300 on the chopping block. The repair backlog has only gone up. I mean, I think it's pretty interesting to hear the Premier and the Minister talk about the previous government's complete uh, uh, disrepair uh, status in terms of it being $5.6 billion. If they're so concerned about the complete disrepair that they left them, why is it almost three times more under the Liberal government after 14 years in office? The repair backlog has only gone up, and now it's $15.9 billion. Children are being sent to schools with leaky roofs, broken boilers. Thousands of students are being sent to learn in dilapidated portables. Schools are park speaker. They Question. are playgrounds and public spaces. They're supposed to support and encourage our kids to learn. Why has the Premier let our schools fall into such dismal disrepair? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And you know, Mr. Speaker, we have a plan moving forward to continue sure to invest in Ontario schools. Uh, we are investing $16 billion over the next decade to, uh, to, to, to invest in the infrastructure in our schools because we know that good school environments provide uh, the optimal learning for students. And that is our focus, Mr. Speaker. I don't know what the focus is of the leader of the third party, Mr. Speaker. The last time she put forward a plan, it promised an embarrassing $60 million dollars a year for school repairs. Oh. That is just 4% of the $1.4 billion that we have committed to to invest in school repair and renewal. Mr. Speaker, we know that Ontario schools are are worthy of this investment, and that's why we're making them. We're making these investments so that students can have the best learning environment Answer. possible, and we have committed that funding to school boards so that they can prioritize the, the, the facilities Thank that you. need repair. Thank you. New question? The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. The emergency department at Bramston Civic Hospital was built to serve 90,000 visits. It experienced more than 138,000 visits last year alone. This year, the hospital has already been forced to declare code gridlock eight times between January and April. And we know that last year at Brampton Civic, there were 4,352 patients laying on stretchers, getting their medical care in public hallways. The Premier's solution is to offer 37 beds. Well, I'm sure that the people of Brampton will take the 37 hospital beds. It's just simply not enough to begin undoing the damage caused by 
many years of Liberal budget cuts and freezes. Is this the best the Premier can offer to the people of Brampton? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to commend the Mayor of Brampton, the leadership of Brampton Civic Hospital and William Osler, the three MPPs as well on this side of the House that have worked so hard on behalf of the residents of Brampton and the surrounding region in Peel. And Mr. Speaker, last week we announced on top of the $17 million of new dollars that we added to the operating budget of William Osler this year, we announced last week 37 new beds for Brampton Civic Hospital itself, 22 beds for Etobicoke General, which is part of the William Osler system, and importantly, and especially, Mr. Speaker, we announced our commitment to fund, in the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, Phase Two of the Peel Memorial Urgent Care Centre, which will involve more than 100 new beds and associated supports yep. once that is fully completed in, in the future, that's Mr. Great. Speaker. Answer. So that is an incredible response, I think, to a reality that's happening in Brampton because of a growing population. It is one of the highest growth populations in this, in this country, and we're responding to that. That's great. Supplementary. Speaker, the Peel Memorial Centre has also been hard hit by the Premier's shortchanging of health care in Brampton. In 2016, the Premier and her Minister of Health were warned that the urgent care centre at Peel Memorial would need to serve 65,000 people per year. 50% more than what it was designed for, and it has to help 50% more people than it was de designed for while being forced to close at 10 o'clock p.m., again due to a lack of support from this Premier and her Liberal government. The 37 beds that the Premier has offered are barely a drop in the bucket when it comes to the underfunding of this magnitude. Will the Premier take any meaningful action to help Brampton hospitals and make sure that Brampton families have the health care that they can count on? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think it's insulting to the leadership in Brampton, the mayor, the leadership at William Osler, to suggest that the investment that we made in the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars last week, that that somehow is meaningless. 37 new beds for Brampton Civic, 22 new beds for Etobicoke General, and Peel Memorial specifically. I'm what we did is we committed to funding, and we're now well this on our way news. to create Phase Two at Peel Memorial. A, by the way, an urgent care, a wellness centre, which is so well received by the community and appreciated by the community. We're building a tower adjacent to that phase two, which will contain an excess, well in excess of 100 new beds. Mr. Speaker, on top of $41 million over the last two years, an increase in their operating budget to William Osler, $41 million in the last two years. If that's meaningless, I don't know what planet that member is living on. Okay. Final supplementary. I'm living in a planet where, in Ontario, people are getting their health care in hallways in hospitals. That's the planet I'm living on. <laughs> Speaker, the NDP has a motion today that would immediately relieve the pressure at Brampton Civic and Peel Memorial because Brampton families shouldn't have to wait to get access to good quality health care, and their loved ones shouldn't be getting their hospital care in public hallways. The William Osler Health System, which runs Brampton Civic and Peel Memorial, has called for an immediate $30.2 million investment to cope with the overcrowding, open two mothballed operating rooms that were built but have never been used, Speaker, and deal with immediate funding shortfalls. This is a start. It won't fix the harm that comes from decades of underfunding, but it's what the people of Brampton need right now. Will the Premier commit Question. to taking this step and helping the people of Brampton get the health care that they need and they deserve? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, like the PCs with regards to the announcement I made in October that I referenced. It seems that the leader of the third party missed our announcement last week, where we announced 37 new beds. In fact, beds that will be available this calendar year. And she missed the fact that in response to the growing demands in Brampton, one of the fastest growing jurisdictions in this country, we're, enhance, we're expanding Peel Memorial, adding more than 100 beds there, plus all the associated supports for rehabilitation and complex continuing care. Mr. Speaker, we're making the investments 2,000, the equivalent, what was announced for Peel is the equivalent of a medium-sized hospital, Mr. Speaker, and we announced 
a couple of weeks ago 2,000 hospital beds and spaces to be able to address the capacity challenges that certain parts of our province is having. Yes, having. Mr. Speaker, this is great news for the people of Brampton. I think she needs to talk to the people of Brampton because they will agree with us that it is Thank solving you. the problem. New question, the Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Today it appears the Minister of Finance will double down on his claims that Ontario has a balanced budget, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Let's start with the Financial Accountability Officer. In May of 2017, the FAO said Spring Outlook said we will continue to be in budget deficit for the next five years. Wow. Five years, Mr. Speaker. Wow. He stated further, beginning in 2018 and 19, the FAO was projecting a steady deterioration in the budget deficit. Yep. So, Mr. Speaker, we have the Minister of Finance pretending we have a balanced budget. We have the FAO chosen and agreed to by the government saying that it is not accurate, that we're in a, a significant deficit. So, my question to the Premier is, who's right, the Minister question. of Finance and his political spin or the nonpartisan FAO? Please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Thank you much, very much, Mr. Speaker. Let's look at some objective realities, Mr. Okay. Speaker. The yeah. fact is, Ontario is leading economic growth in the country, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Our unemployment yeah. rate is the lowest in 17 years, right. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. We are seeing job creation, Mr. Speaker. Just this year, 125,000 net new jobs, 800,000 net new jobs since the recession, Mr. Speaker. The reality is, Ontario is doing very well. But here's the other reality, and the Minister of Finance will be speaking to this as well. Not everyone in this province is sharing in that, Mr. Speaker. Not everyone is feeling that benefit evenly. And so, Mr. Speaker, what we are doing as a government is we are putting in place supports, making sure that people have access in a fair way, Mr. Speaker, that they have access to opportunity across the province, whether it's students who will benefit and are benefiting from free tuition, whether it's young people starting January who will uh, get free prescription medication, or whether it's the millions of people who will benefit from an increased minimum wage. That's the fairness and opportunity that we are standing Stop the clock, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, again to the Premier, I had a pretty specific question, exactly. and that's that the Minister of Finance says the budget is balanced, yeah. yet the FAO, the nonpartisan legislative oversight, agreed to the government to make sure that facts are correct and the numbers are correct. That officer that the government agreed to is saying the government's numbers are wrong. And not just by a little bit, the Financial Accountability Officer's economic and fiscal outlook predicts that Ontario's deficit will be $2.6 billion. So, Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, and rather than talking about something nothing re related to the question, I want to know who is right with their numbers. Is it the FAO, which is the nonpartisan legislative oversight, or is it the Minister of Finance and their fake Liberal spin? Well, Mr. Speaker, I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting that the leader of the opposition would suggest that the economic well-being of the citizens of this province has nothing to do with the economy of the province. That if that shocking. makes no sense, shocking. Mr. Speaker, the fact that there are millions of people in Ontario who can't look after themselves because they're earning $11.60 an hour and they will see a, a minimum wage increase. The member from Leeds Granville is warned. The member from Niagara West Glanbrook is warned. And there's a couple of others that are next. Carry on. An increase to their wage as of January 1st, Mr. Speaker. I think that is uh, that will make a material difference to the people who are. The member from Nipissing is warned. Finish, please. Who are struggling to make ends meet. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that if this Leader of the Opposition doesn't think that creating fairness in this province, creating opportunity in this province, when we're living in a province that is uh, leading economic growth in the country, if he doesn't think that that's a priority, then he is completely off track in terms of what we believe as a government, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from London West. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, last week's announcement of a hardship fund for some of the 500,000 college students who have been financially disadvantaged by the strike is cold comfort to students who are seeing their dreams slip away as this strike drags on, who are experiencing skyrocketing rates of anxiety and depression with few resources on campus to assist them, who are being forced to turn down job offers and are and are worried how they will be able to support themselves. Speaker, if the minister can direct the colleges to create a hardship fund, why doesn't she direct the colleges to go back to the table and work out a negotiated settlement bring stability rather than chaos to the college system? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, I, I uh, am completely sympathetic with the students who want to be back in the classroom. They need to be back in the classroom, Mr. Speaker. And I know that uh, colleges have a responsibility to put in place contingency plans, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that students don't lose this uh, this semester, Mr. Speaker. I know also that faculty want to be back in the classroom, and my understanding is that faculty will begin voting uh, on the employer's last offer through the OLRB beginning today, Mr. Speaker. We want every student in our college system back in class as quickly as possible, Mr. Sure. Speaker. But I know that the, uh, the member opposite understands the process. We need to let that unfold, Mr. Speaker, and we will work as hard as we can to make sure that young people get back into the classroom as quickly as possible. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, again to the Premier. Speaker, with no resolution in sight until at least the end of this week, and that is by no means certain, the college strike has entered uncharted territory in the history of college labour relations. The risk of losing a semester is very, very real for students. Students are worried that they will have to repay OSAP for education they did not receive. When St. Lawrence College student Morgan Campbell called the Premier's office to share her concerns, she was was told to call welfare. Whoa. Speaker, is this really the best advice this Liberal government can offer to students when it is their failure to properly fund the system that created the conditions for this strike and their inaction that has allowed the strike to drag on past the breaking point? Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. It's education and skills development. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. And you know, since this strike began, my focus has been very clearly on the students. I have spoken with students. I have spoken to parents. I have spoken to grandparents, Speaker, all of whom are really concerned that their uh, that their child or grandchild or they themselves are in danger of losing um, losing a semester. It is vitally important that this strike get resolved and get resolved quickly, Speaker. We do respect the collective bargaining process. The colleges are in, in um, bargaining with the uh, with OPSU speaker. We must respect that process, but at the same time, we must keep our eye on students. They are facing real anxiety, as the member opposite has said. They are facing real challenges, financial and otherwise, and that's why we, we're, we're asking that colleges create a dedicated fund to support those students. Thank you. New question, the member from Kingston and the Isles. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, our government continues to take a leadership role in exploring creative and innovative ways to reduce poverty and support people living on low incomes. We have shown our commitment to low-income individuals and families through expanding the Ontario Electricity Support Program, introducing OHIP Plus, providing free prescription medications to children and youth up to 24 years old starting this January, and through the largest increase to the minimum wage in the province's history, raising it to $15 an hour by 2000. In my riding of Kingston and the Islands, I know that these commitments are very important to my constituents. On November the 2nd, the Income Security working, Reform Working Groups released their report titled Income Security, a Roadmap for Change, with recommendations to the government on how to make further improvements to supports and services for people living on low incomes. 
Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you please tell the members of this Question. House more about the Income Security Working Group and their recent report? Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and to the member for her question and her advocacy for low-income Ontarians. Last year, our government established the Income Security Reform Working Group, a First Nations working group, and an urban Indigenous table on income security reform. We asked them to study Ontario's income security system and make recommendations on how to improve it. I want to sincerely thank the members of the three working groups for their valuable contributions over the last year in creating the Roadmap. We will be using the roadmap as a guide to develop a multi-year plan. Our plan will be practical, realistic, and recognize the province's fiscal responsibilities. Mr. Speaker, I know that on this side of the House, we all agree with the need to fundamentally reform the income security system, especially social assistance, because we want our programs to reflect the needs of the people who require them. Thank, thank you. you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for all of the important work that she does to support some of Ontario's most vulnerable individuals and families. I know that people from my riding, like Hugh Siegel, who helped author the recommendations for basic income, Tony Picard, as well as, of course, Elaine Power from Queen's, will all think that these initiatives will be very, very important for our communities. While Ontario's economy is strong, not everyone is experiencing the same opportunities. More people are facing job insecurity and the cost of living is certainly rising. We want to create a fair, modern, accountable, and effective in income security system that will ensure that individuals living on low income will have the tools and resources that they need to provide to improve their overall quality of life. It is also important that we hear from the public about how they feel and how we can reshape Question. our current income security system. Can you please tell us how the public can get involved in providing their feedback on in income security, a roadmap Thank you. for change? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And although we continue to make improvements to the social assistance system, we know we have more work to do. Reforming the income security system, including the transformation of social assistance, will assist us in ensuring all individuals are treated with respect and dignity and are inspired to reach their full potential. We also want to ensure particular attention is focused on the needs and experience of Indigenous peoples. Hearing from individuals who are directly impacted by our current social assistance programs is vital in terms of how we move forward with the recommended changes. And that's why my ministry has posted the income security, a roadmap for change online for public feedback. What we hear over the next 60 days, along with the recommendations from the report, will go a long way in helping us to reform the system into one that is fair, supportive, and puts the needs of the person at the centre of the supports we provide. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Deputy Premier. There's a lot of talk about the Liberals' mythical balanced budget, and it's not just the financial accountability officer who's saying the government's numbers are wrong. It's the Auditor General. You know, last year, she said the government significantly understated the deficit. And the books, I quote, were not prepared following the Canadian public sector accounting standards. She added that the legislature and all Ontarians must be able to rely on the province's consolidated financial statements to fairly report the fiscal results for the year. This year, they can't. So now you've got not only the financial accountability officer, you have the auditor general saying the government's numbers do not add up. And then ra rather than answer something that's not related to the question, I've got a very specific question to the Deputy Premier. Question. The FAO and the Auditor General are saying the government's numbers are wrong. In this financial update we're getting this week, can we be assured that the numbers are actually going to be uh, agreed upon by Thank the you. legislative officers? Yes or no? Thank you. President Treasury Board. President Treasury Board. Uh, yes. yes, thank you very much, Speaker. And I can give you the one-word answer. Yes, the balance, the budget is balanced. In fact, we are on generally accepted the budget, principles. Yes, the budget is balanced. We are on track to balance the budget this year. And do you know what that means, Speaker? That means that instead of slashing and burning services that people rely on, we choose to invest in the people of 
Ontario to bring the province out of the recession. Here, here. Progressive policies like full-day kindergarten here, and free here. tuition that will ensure that the labour force of the future is well-educated, well-trained over the long term. Not to mention the historical <coughs> infrastructure investments Answer. of $190 billion over 13 years and our uh, private economists who agree with our projection that uh, we will have 2.8. <coughs> Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Deputy Premier, my question was, will the FAO and the Auditor General agree with the numbers? It should be very worrisome to every, everyone in Ontario that you have numbers that the government's presenting that the legislative oversight are saying are incorrect. This is unparalleled. You've got the FAO and the Auditor General saying not only are the numbers wrong, the government's making up their own accounting rules. And if it's not good enough that you've got the legislative oversight saying that you're wrong, the highly respected Don Drummond, which this government has praised before, has said by no means are they completely out of the fiscal woods. So everyone is saying your numbers are wrong. Will they do us the, the, the kindness of at least admitting that they're making up their own rules? Will they at least give us the honesty of saying they're not? Numbers do not add up. We're in a deficit. Thank you. Uh, uh, be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, and I wouldn't presume to speak for our independent officers. They're independent. However, what I can do is tell you about some other third-party numbers. So, for example, 800,000 net new jobs since the recession. Wow. The majority are in the private sector and in above-wage industries. About 94.1 per cent of those new jobs are full-time. That's not my data. That's StatsCan. The unemployment rate is 5.9 per cent, which is below the national average for 31 straight months in a wow. row. Lowest it's been in years. Those are not my numbers. Those are StatsCan numbers. Good. What about the GDP? Yeah. Private sector forecasts for real GDP growth is 2.9 per cent in 2017, wow. East increased from 2.4 per cent since we okay. presented our balanced budgets. Other indicators. Canada's. New question, the member from Kenora Rainy River. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier or the Deputy Premier. The NDP has repeatedly confronted the Premier and this government with evidence that people in Grassy Narrows and Wobs among First Nations were still getting sick from mercury poisoning, including young people. But she has repeatedly insisted that the mercury contamination from the Dryden Mill was contained. She even warned that a full cleanup might make things worse. Now we know that her government has known all along that there was still mercury contaminating the river and that this government has been concealing this truth. When did the Premier find out that the ground under the mill was still contaminated with mercury, and who gave the order to keep this truth from the people of Grassy Narrows? Please. Please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Minister. For that, uh, that question. Uh, the uh, Domtar report, which has been in the news uh, recently, uh, Speaker, was received by the uh, Ministry in uh, uh, September uh, 16. It is the position of this uh, government that uh, all information related to uh, the mercury situation on uh, Grassy Narrows First Nation and on the English Wabagoon River should be transparently shared. The ministry is uh, reviewing that, uh, that report now uh, to see what uh, the consequences of that report are and what should be done. I should say, Speaker, that we have a uh, plan in place to deal with the mercury pollution on Grassy Narrow on the Domtar site. We are working with Grassy Narrow yes, First Nation, with White Dog First Nation. We are working with the ministry uh, officials. We have committed to uh, clean up the uh, mercury site there. Supplementary. Speaker, the fact of the matter is that this government has had that report in its possession for over a year, and this government has always known this information. 
information. This is not new information. The minister did not let the people of Grassy Narrows know. How is that transparent? Instead, a few months after receiving the report, he told this House that Quote, there is no source unquote, of mercury contamination. The people of Grassy Narrows and Wabs among First Nations deserve to know why they have not been told the truth. Will the Premier tell us when she knew about the contamination and who gave the order to conceal this truth? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the ministry, the government received this report in uh, September 16. We are committed to resolving this issue. I can tell you, Speaker, that in the past year or so, I have been to Grassy Narrows twice. I have met with the, the chief at Grassy Narrows. Finish, please. And the chiefs of White Dog. I have had uh, meetings with Min former Minister Murray on two occasions uh, with the leaders from the uh, from the communities. We have had meetings with the federal, the then federal minister, Minister Bennett. We are committed to this. We have recently uh, uh, provided about uh, 5.2 million dollars to support pre-remediation work. And subsequent to that, we've set aside $85 million for remediation efforts. This government is serious about dealing with this issue. Thank you. New question, the member from Etobicoke North. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, bonjour, Annie. Bonjour. Well, my question, Speaker. Good morning. And reconciliation, the Honourable David Zimmer. Speaker, as you will know, there's a long history of treaty making between First Nations and the British Crown in Ontario. And this history actually dates back from uh, 1701 to the present day. In fact, Ontario is unique in Canada for the number and variety of treaties between First Nations and the Crown. And there are actually about 46 treaties and counting. These include land purchases uh, on, across the entire province. Last week, Speaker, as you'll know, Ontario celebrated Treaty Recognition Week, with events taking place all across our province that brought together Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples together to learn about our shared history. Speaker, can the minister elaborate on the significance of Treaty Recognition Week and our government's work towards reconciliation in this area? Thank you. Minister of Indigenous Relations and uh, Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, treaties are the reason Canada and Ontario exist as we know them today. And all Ontarians, especially students, need to gain a better understanding of treaties. Ontario is the first province in Canada to legislate the observance of an annual treaties recognition week. And during the first uh, recognition week last November, we connected many Indigenous speakers with hundreds of students across Ontario through our Living Library Initiative. This year, we held more than 200 events in 60 communities with 50 Indigenous speakers. And last week, I was in uh, Whitefish First Nation to celebrate the Treaty Recognition Week with Grand Chief Madabi and Chief Shining Turtle. We launched two very, very important children's books on the history of treaties and their significance. It's through the Recognition Week that our three-year treaty strategy and, and government is working to build a better understanding of the significance and importance of treaties. Thank you, Speaker. It's clear that Treaty Recognition Week is, as the Minister just outlined, offering an opportunity to foster greater understanding and awareness of the importance of treaties across the province of Ontario, raising awareness of treaties and of Indigenous histories and cultures more broadly is of great importance to this province, to this government, and to this country, particularly through educational opportunities for youth. Speaker, I know that our government believes that all students, including Indigenous and non-Indigenous students, are enriched by learning about the histories, cultures, perspectives, and contributions of First Nation, Métis, and Inuit peoples in Canada. I understand that our government is taking steps to ensure that Ontario's curriculum includes mandatory learning about residential schools and Indigenous peoples' historical and contemporary uh, contributions. Speaker, would the minister share with this government, share with us, what the government is doing about updating the curriculum in response to Question. the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action? Thank you, Minister. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, last week I joined the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation at Millican Mills High School in Markham wow. to announce our government's three-year annual investment of $5 million to support the implementation of the revised curriculum. Yeah. Ontario has been working with Indigenous partners to make revisions to the curriculum that will strengthen mandatory learning on the history of residential schools, the legacy of colonialism, and the importance of treaties. We will also be investing in capacity building for teachers and supporting the development of resources that are linked to the revised curriculum. Promoting greater awareness of Indigenous histories and cultures is one of the many steps on Ontario's journey of healing and reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. Actions such as these these revised curriculums reflect our government's commitment to working with Indigenous Answer. partners and rebuilding relationships based on trust and respect for First Nation, Métis and Inuit. I want to thank the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Recon Reconciliation for its work. Thank you. A new question. A member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. A global news story last week shed some light on the Premier's attitude towards Chief Government Whip is warned. Carry on. Thank you, Speaker. A global news story last week shed some light on the Premier's attitude towards students in the ongoing community college strike. A St. Lawrence College student contacted the Premier's office because she had concerns about her second semester OSAP loans. Speaker, the alleged response from staff in the Premier's office call welfare. Call welfare, Speaker. Speaker, this is absolutely shameful. Which staff member did the Premier instruct to tell students to call welfare when in financial distress? Thank you, Speaker. Well, I can, I can tell you that no one, no Premier has ever done more for college and university students than our Premier Kathleen Wynne. No one has done more. Free tuition for over 200,000 students, Speaker. Free tuition plus help with living expenses. Another one third of our students are getting additional help with their, uh, to defray the cost of tuition, Speaker. We have opened the window of opportunity, opened the door of opportunity for students in this province unlike it has ever been before. Speaker, we believe that when students work hard, when they get accepted to college or to university, money should never stand in the way. And that's why we've brought forth the greatest transformation of student assistance ever in the history of Ontario, yes, in the history of Canada, Speaker. I can tell you that internationally, people are looking at what we have done to open opportunities for students, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Deputy Premier. Well, these investments don't do anything for students who've already sold personal belongings to pay their rent. Speaker, the Premier has shown a complete lack of leadership and failed to act in the best interests of students since the first day of the strike. While my Ontario Progressive Conservative colleagues and I called on the Premier to take action and bring both sides back to the bargaining table, the Liberal government sat on its hands for weeks. Now the Premier's staff allegedly treats college students desperate for financial assistance with disdain and disrespect. Speaker, how can college students across Ontario trust that the Premier will act in the be their best interests ever again? Thank you. Speaker, students have been caught in the middle of this strike since the beginning. It is not fair what students are going through, Speaker. It is just not fair. That's why we've worked hard to bring the two sides together, to negotiate, Speaker. I know the party opposite has no respect for the collective bargaining process, Speaker. Zero. Uh, if you look at their campaign, their uh, platform last time around, Speaker, a number of initiatives to weaken collective bargaining, Speaker. On this side, we are very concerned, very concerned about students, and that's why we've instructed colleges to create a fund with the net savings of, uh, uh, from the strike speaker, and we're consulting with students groups, the College Student Alliance and other student leaders, on how best to distribute the money from the savings of this Sir. strike speaker. But the sooner those students are back in the classroom, the better off we all will be. Your question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the acting premier, the deputy premier. Yesterday, I was in London 
talking to Nicole Dorsers. Nicole told me about her brother, who struggles with his mental health, and how when he needed help at the hospital, he was forced to wait in the ER for 16 hours before being admitted onto a stretcher in a public hallway for four days. In fact, they gave him four hours in a room, then yanked him out of the room and put him into a hallway for four days. Stories like this are everywhere in London, particularly when it comes to people trying to get help for mental health issues. That's because London Health Sciences has been at 130 per cent capacity in its psychiatric beds every single day between May 1st and September 22nd this year. In fact, on August 22nd, Question. the hospital reached an extraordinary high of 165 per cent capacity in its mental health beds. Why is the Premier okay with these shocking numbers and okay with Thank disappointing you. Nicole and her brother? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and that's why I find it hard to understand, given that expressed concern, why that member opposite and her party would have voted against the legislation that will allow our paramedics, our EMS services, to, to, to transport mental health patients to the most appropriate clinical location. We invested and opened up a remarkable, with the CMHA, a remarkable crisis centre in the community in London, uh, but they voted against, voted and against I suspect it. when it comes to final reading, they're going to vote against it again, it. which will provide our EMS workers the opportunity to actually transport and deliver mental health patients, even with a history with that crisis centre, to that crisis centre. For some Answer. reason, she wants to continue to divert them to the hospital ER. Mr. Speaker, we also are dramatically increasing our investment in mental health beds, and I'm happy to talk about that in some Thank time. you. Commentary. Well, Speaker, you know, this Liberal government talks a, a good game about dealing with the mental health problems that we have in this province, but when we have a hospital that's at 165 per cent capacity in its mental health beds, we have a serious problem that they've been ignoring for a very, very long time. The hospital overcrowding crisis didn't happen yesterday, Speaker. It didn't happen overnight. It's been years in the making, starting with the last Conservative government closing 28 hospitals, firing 6,000 nurses, closing 7,000 hospital beds, and worsening with every single Liberal budget cut and hospital funding freeze that followed, and there were many. We must do right by Nicole Speaker, her brother, and all those who have been let down by our health care system under this Premier and this Question. House Minister's watch. What is the Premier's plan to fix the overcrowding crisis at London Health Sciences? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I implore the member to just leave the PCs alone for a little bit, despite the fact that they closed almost yeah. 10,000 hospitals, because her party, the NDP, when they were in government, closed 9,600 yeah. hospital beds. But what, we're doing, but what we're doing, Mr. Speaker, at London Health Sciences, we're opening 48 new beds, Mr. Speaker. 24 of those no, new beds are mental health beds, acute care mental health beds in the hospital and 24 additional and by the, the way mr speaker for the entire month of october there were only two days when the london health center health sciences center was above capacity and mr speaker we're making the investments millions of dollars 48 new beds but there's a long list of investments that we're making in london which includes mental health beds that i referenced the 24 both the victoria and university sites of london health sciences 24 new acute beds, six new acute beds at St. Joseph's Healthcare, and we also have 43 as yet unallocated beds that, because we were so insistent that these beds that I referenced be up and running as soon Sir. as possible, we have an additional 43, which, quite, which may very well end up at London Health Sciences as well or other places where they're Thank needed, you. Mr. Speaker. Question, the member from Etobicoke Centre. Thanks very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the minister responsible for small business. Uh, Speaker, before I ran for office, I ran my own small business, and my dad and my grandfather were both entrepreneurs, and they were actually very successful at it. So I know a little bit about the risks that entrepreneurs take on to be successful, but I also know how important they are to our economy. 
This week's speaker is Global Entrepreneurship Week, uh, which helps people to explore their potential as entrepreneurs and raise the profile of entrepreneurs here in Ontario and across the world, frankly. In Canada, Global Entrepreneurship Week is being hosted by Futurepreneur Canada. Now, for those of you who don't know Futurepreneur, Futurepreneur is an amazing organization, and they've helped to launch over almost 2,200 small businesses here in Ontario alone, Speaker. Now, we have in Ontario one of the fastest growing entrepreneurial sectors in the country, and frankly, in the world. And so uh, we have Question. a lot to celebrate here in Ontario to recognize the contributions that entrepreneurs make. So, Minister, could you please tell us what our government is doing to support small businesses and entrepreneurs? Thank you, Minister Responsible for Small Business. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Etobicoke Centre for this very important question. Of course, the member was a very successful businessman in his own right and has been a real leader in the development of the Blue West Business Improvement Area. Just last month during Small Business Week, I had the pleasure of welcoming Future Premier to Queen's Park to showcase some of the great work of young Ontario entrepreneurs they support. We also brought together women entrepreneurs from across the province to hear from them how we can better help women get a start and grow a business. We're working hard to ensure entrepreneurs across the province have the tools they need to succeed. Through the Ontario Network of Entrepreneurs, our small business enterprise centres support the startup and growth of Main Street businesses in every quarter of Ontario. And last month, we announced the launch of the Small Business Access, a uh, one window service to help entrepreneurs access resources and start their own small business. We'll continue to create the right conditions for entrepreneurs in Ontario to both innovate and grow. Thank you. Supplementary. Thanks very much, Minister. Minister, I've spoken with you before on this topic, and I know that you understand how vital our entrepreneurs are to our economy, whether they be in Etobicoke or whether they be in Peterborough. But one of the things that we have heard the Premier speak to this morning in question period is our economic performance. And this would not be possible without the hard work of our entrepreneurs. In fact, to ensure that our economy supports well, we need to support our entrepreneurs. Uh, and supporting entrepreneurship is also critical for another reason, because as our economy evolves, uh, Speaker, more and more career opportunities, job opportunities will be related to entrepreneurship. So we need to support our youth and our young adults in starting and growing businesses. Last week, Speaker, on this note, I held a youth advisory group in my riding of Etobicoke Centre, where I invited Scott Bauman from Futurepreneur to speak to young people in my riding about how they can be successful entrepreneurs. So, Minister, can you tell us how, what you are doing to help youth start and grow businesses here in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Uh, to the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Of economic Development and Growth. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Planting that seed of entrepreneurialism is so important, and frankly, the fact that we planted those seeds many years back are really paying off for us today as we become one of the most innovative climates in the world. Uh, that's why, Mr. Speaker, many years ago we invested in Summer Company. 8,600 youth have started their own businesses through that program. In 2017 alone, 944 businesses were started through Summer Company. That program was successful, so we decided to start Starter Company. And that program expands the program uh, to people 18 to 29 years of age throughout the year. Earlier this year, we expanded that, Mr. Speaker, to Starter Company Plus, which has no age limits at all. In six months so far, Starter Company Plus has been responsible for starting up 772 businesses. Answer. The business of Starter expanded, and over 700 jobs created. Mr. Speaker, we're going to keep investing in those seeds of entrepreneurialism in Ontario.